It's an absolute pleasure to be here today to do this TED Talk, and I wanted to start with a story of something that happened to me a couple of weeks ago in the constituency when I visited an elderly friend who'd just come out of hospital. While we were waiting for his son to come to visit, we were chatting in the kitchen and I was doing the washing up. The back door opened eventually and his son walked in with his wife. She took one look at me and she said, who are you? I'm Natasha, I said, with my marigolds. Oh, his MP friend. Yes, I smiled at her. Nothing. She did not smile back. Nice to see an MP doing some work for a change. <laughs> the way that people feel about their politicians is not new. It's been growing for decades, and it's common to any country that calls itself a mature democracy. The relationship between voters and the people they elect is like a relationship in which one partner has had an affair, but for the sake of the children, the couple stay together. <laughs> the cheated partner will never forget, will never forgive, and will never trust again. In fact, they're just waiting for someone better to come along. Meanwhile, the couple is growing apart, they spend less time together, with fewer friends in common, and no shared interests or hobbies. When they do talk, the cheating partner gives evasive answers, never lying, but never really telling the truth. And so it is with politicians and voters. Distrust, dislike, blame. We're still living together, but the atmosphere is getting worse and worse. We've grown so different from the people we represent that we even have our own name. We're called the political class. Where that different difference is most evident is in the language we use. Politicians don't speak like people anymore. I'm going to show you an example. I could have chosen any number of clips. This was just an example of something that I saw in Parliament last week, um, and big apologies to Andrew Lansley. Um, the minister is asked in Parliament whether we will be given a vote on intervention in Syria before the government takes a decision. So, yes or no? Let, no, let me, let me be quite clear about this. Um, we are in a position, as the Prime Minister made perfectly clear yesterday, where the question does not arise now because no such decision has been made. Um, all, all that the Prime Minister said, I thought perfectly clearly yesterday, was that he has been very clear, as was the case in relation to Libya, that he seeks to secure an opportunity for the House to debate and express its view through a vote on these matters. He did that in relation to Libya. Uh, Subject, of course, to the simple question, it is a hypothetical question at the moment. Uh, the Prime Minister is determined, as indeed is the Foreign Secretary, that the House should have the opportunity, likewise, to express its view. <laughs> so, the Minister was clear, the Prime Minister was clear twice, he was determined twice, but was it a yes or a no? And when normal people read, hear something like this, their hearts sink. And they think, it's a simple question. Why can't they give a simple answer? And I know just how this happened. I, I did this recently myself when I was, uh, again, in the constituency, when the plans for a high-speed train were um, published uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and it turned out that the track was going right through the houses and businesses of many of the people who live in the constituency. And I thought, right, I'll call public meetings. I called three public meetings, one in each of the affected areas. Um, and uh, you know, we sent out letters, and the number of people turned, who turned up was absolutely amazing. I hold lots of public meetings, but never had I seen so many people turning up. And these weren't the sort of people who normally come to public meetings. I welcomed them, and I said how I was just as surprised as they were. Um, I didn't know that this was coming through here. And so I wanted to give them all a chance to have their say. I wanted them to be able to ask their questions, for me to take those questions down to Westminster and hopefully bring them some answers. Are you for it or against it? shouted someone. Well, um, that's not really what this meeting's about. This is really much more about giving you the opportunity to participate in a consultation exercise. Is that for or against? Um, well, I do recognise the economic importance of a big infrastructure project such as this, and there are connectivity and capacity issues, so you're for it. The meeting didn't go well. The second meeting was no better. 
By the third meeting, I thought whatever happens, I must say, was I for or was I against? And I decided there were probably benefits for big cities, but a rural place like North East Derbyshire, it might destroy their lives, and they certainly weren't going to get any direct gains from it. So at the third meeting, I welcomed everyone, and I said what we were doing. Are you for it or against it, came the shout. I am against it, I said. After that, we had an interesting debate about the pros and cons of HS2. Most people were against it, but a lot of people were for it. But the point was that the fury and the heat had gone out about the issue of where I stood and we could discuss where we go from here. They asked me a simple question as the person that they had elected to represent them and they wanted a simple answer. So why do politicians give these evasive answers? Why do we use language like connectivity and capacity issues with people where we know full well they don't understand what we're talking about? It's partly because so many people, so many groups, who even if we don't want to please them, we certainly don't want to antagonize. As politicians, we don't just have those people who are our constituents, whether they voted for us or not. We also have to consider our parties, without which we would not be MPs. And within our parties, we have conf conflicting loyalties. There's our leader in the whip's office on the one hand, but there's also our local party activists. They are the ones who've helped us get elected, and they keep us there. They expect their views to carry extra weight. Then there are the favorite pollsters and focus groups who our leaders think will determine the next election. They obviously change around quite a lot. And then there's the need to avoid hostages to fortune so that journalists and our political opponents can't accuse us with, ah, yes, but you said, or take anything we say in, for example, a TED talk, take it out of context, put it in a leaflet, and then put it through people's letterboxes. In the clip we saw, the minister was clear that the prime minister was determined to seek to let parliament express its view. That is a long way off from promising to let us influence his decision. Political language like this is designed to give no one anything to get hold of, to quote, to throw back at us. But most of all, it is designed to exclude anyone not in the political class from the decision-making process. And now look at the few politicians who are most popular today. Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson, Diane Abbott, Dennis Skinner. Dennis is my constituency neighbor. And what I hear most about him is, I might not agree with him, Duck, but I like the way he said what he thinks. <laughs> and I've seen all four of them get into very heated discussions with people who disagree with them, and all four of them argue back. Most politicians looking at that think, you can't do that! But by engaging in debate with people in language that is designed to be understood, they are showing respect for them. They're not setting themselves above, and they're not setting themselves apart. They aren't excluding people. They are doing what leaders do. They are saying that they have thought matters through and that this is their opinion of what should be done. It allows the people they represent to disagree, to argue their case, and even to vote against them. They are allowing people to take part in making decisions and giving them the power back to make an informed choice. Most importantly, it closes the gap between politicians and the people we represent. And it is important to close that gap, because the wider it grows, the more it allows not just eccentrics and mavericks, not just those people who speak in simple, clear terms to jump in, but it will eventually be plugged by a persuasive, eloquent, hate-filled demagogue. In that broken relationship, where the couple is sleeping in separate rooms and barely speaking to each other anymore, the wronged party will feel that they have finally met someone worth leaving for. If we don't want that to happen, we've got to start talking and going out again, doing things together. And it is politicians who have to take the lead. We have to say what we think, be prepared to have a disagreement, and sometimes even to change our minds. Most importantly, we have to stop setting ourselves apart, stop being evasive, and stop being afraid to offend. So, in many years' time, when that woman comes through the back door while I'm doing the dishes, if she says, oh yes, his MP friend, and she grabs a tea towel, and she does the dishes with me, and chats to me about how, how her father-in-law is doing, that's when we'll have made a start. Thank you very much.